Today on Across the Fence, we're answering a pressing question. How do you make apple cider? Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael, and today we're at the UVM Horticulture Research and Education Center in South Burlington, and we've called on an expert apple cider maker. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome back to Across the Fence, Terry Bradshaw. Terry, you're the center director, and you've been making cider for decades, and I'm really interested to learn. I, had plenty of cider, but I've never been on the making side of it. So again, thanks for having us. Great, welcome back. We're gonna talk and demonstrate cider making, but I need to acknowledge at the beginning, the hard cider market and its explosive growth in the past decade or so, and UVM, you have played a role in some of that, providing some of the research. Tell us a little bit about the hard cider market. Yeah, the, the hard cider market took off you know, about 90, 1990, 1995, um, really with Woodchuck owning the market nationally. Uh, they were one of the, really the only national uh, brand at the time. Um, and they were, you know, a, a decent sized player. But then around 2010 or so, uh, the market just started to substantially grow. And Vermont's had a key piece of that, of course, with, with Woodchuck themselves, uh, but also a number of other companies uh, to where it's now become a major part of uh, the Apple industry. Not so much growing apples specifically for it, to some degree we do, but it's really changed the market for seconds or utility fruits and actually lifted the price for growers. So growers are really, really receptive to that. And I've said we're here to talk about apple cider, not hard cider, but again, it is important to know that the market has changed as a result of what we call dessert fruit or what you've told me is not the ideal fruit that you want to make cider. The bulk of the juice often comes from dessert varieties because that's what we have the seasonings, the flavorings, the, the really specific tastes that come into cider often come from other varieties that contribute other uh, components to that blend. What we're talking about today and gonna demonstrate is not hard cider, it's what most Vermonters know as cider, and that's different than apple juice. Apple juice is, is kind of the, the final end of the highly refined, highly processed juice, if you will, uh, that, that comes from the apple. You can't really call it cider anymore. Usually comes uh, from concentrate. Um, it's not something people typically make at home. What we're gonna make here is fresh cider. So what, what is the equipment I need to be able to make that fresh cider at home? Yeah, on, there's a few different ways. Really, all you need to do is crush the apple and press it. So those, as long as you have something that will do those two, two steps, you'll be fine. On a commercial scale, uh, people use maybe a rack and cloth uh, press or a belt press. But often on a home scale, you would use something like this, which is just a screw type press, uh, very uh, commonly available for a relatively inexpensive price, and we'll get the job done. So what about the apples that we're gonna use? I'm a Macintosh guy, but do we need to have Gala or, or some other specific apple to make our homemade apple cider? Yeah, the, the answer is yes to all of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I worked for a grower one time in Massachusetts, actually, but he said that it's not New England cider unless it has a good dose of Macintosh in it. And that's because of the flavor profile people were used to. But really, cider is made from usually from uh, second grade or utility grade fruit, or maybe stuff off your own tree at home. It's not necessarily that, that best you know, prime apple that you're gonna put in the fruit bowl, um, but you wanna ideally have a blend of flavors, a little bit of tartness to it, a little bit of sweetness to it, or aromatics, that's one thing that Macintosh and even Gala bring is a real aromatic uh, component, but usually a blend. So, so you'll have you have an example here. Yeah, we have a blend, we have some Williams Pride, we have some Silkins, uh, and these are seconds from our farm stands. They're a mix of what we have. I think this is an excellent early season and blend, but it changes throughout the year. So ideally, your taste for your cider should change as the fruit ripen. Well, I think part of the reason to do this is it's fun. It it's should be fun. fun. Yes. But there are some important food safety considerations that we need to be sure we highlight before we even go anywhere near a press. And those Absolutely. are... Yeah. So at a time, there, there was a time when cider was considered too acidic for pathogenic bacteria to, to survive. Uh, and that's not true. There are bacteria that have evolved around that, um, that have been around for decades. They are ubiquitous in the environment or maybe not everywhere, but they're, they're out there. And there's something you need to pay attention to. 
really what it comes down to is having clean fruit, clean equipment, and clean processing downstream. When you wash the press, there's usually a sanitation step involved, even if it's just a little bit of bleach. But if you step back even further, it was very common when this issue arose for fruit to be made from dropped fruit. So fruit that, that hit the ground and stayed on the ground and were often picked up at the end of the season. And so those fruit were laying in manure or other soil uh, that, was, that was contaminated. Um, and so the key is to use tree picked fruit. If you do use what we might call windfall fruit that, you know, if it hits the ground, you know, you know as soon as it hits the ground, it's not, it's not radioactive, but when it sits there for a day or two or where it sits, you know, if it's on clean ground and you get it up and, you, and then you wash it, that's another, another important step. But clean fruit is, is really key. Because deer do like the apple orchard. Yeah, deer, birds, rabbits, they're all out there. Keeping in mind that this is fun, that there are food safety considerations, um, you have touched on some of the equipment. Tell us about the process. Sure, step up here and I'll show you how. Cider making is a two-step process. First, you need to grind the fruit to, to break it up so that you can actually get the juice out of it, and then you need to press it somehow. Because we're, so, we're not gonna drink the skin. We're not gonna drink the skin. Yeah, the, 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 the juicing process is really getting juice out of the cells. There's, there are flavors that come from the skins. Absolutely. But, and you get that when, okay. you, when you crush the fruit. But a press like this does both of those steps. Sometimes you'll have them in two separate units, but we have a grinder and we have the press. I assume I can spend a lot, or hopefully I can spend for something like this that you're recommending for the backyard, what do I need to spend, Terry? Yeah, if you were to buy one of these presses, uh, and they're fairly easy to find on the internet, or even uh, some regional uh, shops have them, five to 600 bucks uh, will kind of get you through the door. You can often find them on Craigslist and places, may need to have a little bit of work done, but for, for probably a few hundred bucks might be the, the minimum, uh, but to buy something right off the shelf, okay. five, 600 bucks. All right, back to the process. Okay, so we want to crush the fruit, first and we'll crush it in this in this grinder here that dumps it straight into a, uh, a tub that collects the, the the crushed fruit there's a, a bag basically a, a filter bag that filters out uh, the seeds and stems and the the, uh, the pulp and then we uh, as the as we're filling that you'll start to see juice dripping out we just catch it into a pan uh, and then this acts as a filter is really all that's, that's what it is. Yep, yep. Yep. It's going to filter through. It's going to hit the pan and, and then we'll slide it up and we'll put some pressure on there and squeeze it out and we'll have juice. Okay. Uh, there is one piece of electricity that helps run the grinder back here. Yep. So if you want to go ahead uh, you can go ahead and plug that in. Yep. Cider making can often be kind of messy. If I'm making a lot, I'll often wear a, a vinyl apron just to kind of keep things off of me, but you'll see you get a little overspray. It's nice to do it on a deck outside. Have a hose handy. And you're for the most part allowing each of these apples to sort of get ground up. You're not throwing eight apples in at once. Uh... Not on a grinder like this. The commercial scale grinders, they can, they'll take them as fast as you can dump them in. Um, this one would, it would plug up pretty fast if you're running So maybe months. while you're doing that, you could give us a little bit of an estimate. I asked you about the equipment. What's my cost in the apples, Terry, to make a, uh, again, you had, I can't tell, you have 100 apples in that box? Yeah, probably 150. Okay. Um, you know, if you were to buy, right now, orchard, commercial orchards are selling cider grade fruit for six to 12 bucks a bushel for that. It'll make two or three gallons, so three to four bucks for a gallon. If you've got a tree in your backyard, it's almost free. While we're talking about the My Backyard Tree, would you just touch again on that food safety piece and you're not recommending that we're using things off the ground that have been there for an hour or 24 or 48 hours? All the fruit that I'm pressing right now have been tree picked. I, it, it's not absolutely critical. Like I say, if you have something that hits the ground and you pick it up like while you're picking, um, if it's clean, if it's sound, what we call sound, which means the skin is not broken uh, and you wash them, it's great, um, but you just can't. I'm underscoring it. it because it is important. Wash the fruit, keep your equipment clean, keep yourself clean, and you follow the basic uh, food safety rules and you're having fun. Absolutely. So you've, you've ground the apples, we've yep. turned the power off and stopped that noise. Um, this is an interesting look. Uh, I could almost suggest it looks like a coleslaw. There's a lot of different colors, coleslaw, varieties. Coleslaw, yeah, a little, uh, yep. almost like applesauce. We can, we can push this pan forward a little bit so that the, uh, we can apply the screw pressure directly to the fruit. 
We ready to press? This we is, sure this are. This is the second stage. We've ground and now we need to apply pressure. Um, sometimes people will make presses and, and um, it's something you gotta be kind of careful of because you are putting things under pressure and so you could, you could potentially have things pop and break. Um, but when people do that, they might use some kind of hydraulics, like commercial presses would use a hydraulics. I've seen where people have used versions of car jacks and things like that. Um, and that's fine, that, that works, but you've really got to pay attention. So something off the shelf that, that's been purposely built for this purpose um, usually is a little bit better way to go. Well, again, this is a great demonstration. This must make you feel like you're really, this is the point when you really feel like you're making the cider. Getting something done, right? Uh, we can see the juice beginning to come out, and of course it's going to hit that little drain and flow into the uh, little collection tank you've got down below. I knew it would be simple, but this is simpler than I thought it would be. It's really easy. Uh, only in Vermont. We can get uh, tree fruit, we can get the sap to make maple syrup. These are things we can do in our backyard. It connects us more with where our food comes from. It keeps us healthier. Uh, and just a, a great example. I have about 30 seconds left, Terry. Is there anything else that you want to make sure people know about making their own cider at home uh, before we got to say goodbye? Yeah, uh, there's, there's a couple things to think about. This cider is not going to last long. It's unprocessed, so it's going to turn fairly quickly. Um, if you want to make your own hard cider, that, that is a process of using the turning process to your own benefit. Um, but if you want to keep this as sweet cider, refrigerate it, freeze it. A lot of people will fill the freezer. You can also can it. Um, that's actually a great way to ensure the food safety because you're, you're, you're heat processing it. Um, but that's an important thing. This stuff is not gonna, gonna, gonna hold for very long. But it's gonna taste great and when we'll have a, a toast as we go off camera. Terry, thanks again for having us here down at the Hort Farm. Much appreciated. Great, thank you. That is our program for today. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence.